In 2001, an outbreak of foot and mouth disease devastated the British farming industry. As many as 6 to 8 million animals were culled, and thousands of outbreaks were recorded around the country. Not only was there a massive economic cost, but the outbreak claimed the livelihoods of many a farmer and community. In today's video, we shall cover just what foot and mouth disease is, how it took hold in the United Kingdom, and how the disaster played out. It is perhaps helpful to start with a description of what foot and mouth disease actually is. Foot and mouth disease is separate and different to the human hand, foot and mouth disease. Foot and mouth disease, or FMD for short, is caused by an RNA virus that affects the split-hooved animals. This includes cows, sheep and pigs. An infected animal will present with blisters in the mouth, teats and in between the hooves. These blisters, along with a fever or stringy saliva, are telltale signs of the disease. FMD is incredibly infectious, spread through pus, blood, saliva, or stagnant water. It can be carried on a person's clothing, spread by touch, and even by air. The disease can severely weaken the infected and can result in the death of younger animals. Animals infected with the disease are not fit for human consumption. It is therefore a disease that those rearing animals for human consumption ought to be vigilant. The first known case for this crisis was in February of 2001, spotted at an abattoir in Essex. A vet by the name of Craig Kirby noticed that some of the pigs for slaughter were displaying clear signs of FMD. These pigs were traced to a finishing farm near Northumberland, owned by a farmer by the name of Bobby Waugh. It didn't take long to inspect Waugh's farm where signs of FMD were evident. The pigs were held in squalid conditions, with the majority of the pigs infected at various stages. It was thought that the disease would have been present at Waugh's farm as early as January that year, with him sending his infected pigs to slaughter, risking other animals of being infected. It is believed his pigs were infected by consuming unproperly processed slurry, which contained FMD-infected animal tissues, carrying a relatively new Asian strain of the disease. From both Waugh's farm and the abattoir in Essex, the disease was able to spread to other nearby farms. Through airborne spread and through the sale of infected animals, FMD was able to spread around the country. Exports from the UK were banned by the likes of the European Union, meaning there were more animals for sale domestically. Two livestock markets in the towns of Longtown and Hexham unknowingly sold a handful of infected sheep to farms around England and Wales. From this point, the usual movement of animals with now infected vehicles ensured the disease would continue to spread. For those 25,000 sheep who were sold at the markets on that day along with the infected, they too could have carried FMD to their destinations. Unlike a previous outbreak in 1967, the movement of animals was on a national level. From the sale to the rearing to the slaughter, the animal could be moved multiple times, hundreds of miles at a time. By the start of March 2001, almost 100 separate outbreaks had been recorded around the country. The Ministry for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, or MAFF, initially believed that the disease could be controlled by slaughtering all animals within 3 kilometres from a confirmed case. The process would involve the farmer working out the value of his herd before arranging for the slaughterman to arrive at the farm. The slaughterman then prepared the animals into smaller groups. The livestock would then be killed by either a bolt gun or a regular gun, as the former were in short supply. Hundreds of animals a day could be culled on the larger farms, meaning there would be many corpses to be disposed of. Though often, the rotting corpses would have to wait days for disposal. The disposal was often done by mass graves or huge pyres bellowing putrid black smoke. Airfields, commercial dumps, and unused grounds were all used to dispose the animals culled during the crisis. By the end of March, this policy saw some 90,000 animals culled, buried, and burned. Vast, foul-smelling pyres littered the countryside. Yet, despite all the slaughtering, by the end of March, more than 400 outbreaks were recorded. Public access to the countryside was limited as to stop the spread of FMD. Tony Blair, the then Prime Minister, pushed back upcoming local and general elections, hoping to bide time and to avoid any potential bad will from handling the crisis poorly. Around this time, another linked outbreak from FMD was recorded in Holland in a number of farms. The Dutch approach at first was the same as the British, to call animals in the immediate vicinity. 
when this did not provide the desired results, livestock were vaccinated. Over 1,800 farms had their animals vaccinated, which significantly decreased the instances of outbreaks. After two weeks, the vaccinated animals were to be culled. By the 22nd of April 2002, FMD in the Netherlands was brought under control at the expense of around a quarter of a million animals slaughtered. By April, the United Kingdom too announced that FMD was under control, but that was far from the truth. At this point, there had been over 1,500 outbreaks of the disease. Focus had shifted from cattle to sheep being the problem. Data from the previous month's outbreaks was scrubbed from the MAFF website, instead only showing the daily figures. The way that slaughters and outbreaks were classified then were altered as to reduce the numbers presented to the public. One example of the consequences of this was that in Cumbria, farmers reported 24 outbreaks of FMD. The MAFF only counted 9 of these. There are plenty of errors that resulted in healthy farms or farms outside of the 3 kilometers having their livestock culled an error, including an instance of a farm mistaken for one hundreds of miles away. Tony Blair's government and the MAFF looked at what measures were taken in the last epidemic in 1967, not amending the protocol to account for 34 years of change. This went as far as reprinting the same no entry warning signs that had been used during the 1960s. There was little to no new thinking as to how to best deal with the problem. Key lessons such as not moving animals and ensuring the culling and burial of the infected animals were rarely put into practice. There was little thought given to the possibility of a large outbreak of FMD before the cases of 2001. All contingency plans were based on no more than 10 premises affected by FMD at the start of the possible outbreak. It is thought that at the start of the crisis, almost 60 locations were infected. The response was always going to be on the back foot, and without proactive or imaginative thought, the problem would not be easily solved. By May, focus was on the upcoming general election, with little regard given to the some 30,000 animals culled on average every single day. An average of five new outbreaks a day were reported between May and September. The focus on culling infected animals and those within three kilometers remained the only course of action, save for a limited vaccination program in Devon. It would take on average two and a half months to eradicate the disease in a given location, ensuring that it had not returned. By September, the crisis was dealt with, but it would not be until January of 2002 that the last cull took place. The effect on the economy was significant, costing the government £3 billion to deal with the crisis, with a further loss to the economy of £5 billion. It was not only the farmers who lost their entire livelihoods, but many countryside businesses were devastated by the restrictions of movement. Farmers in total received £1.1 billion in compensation for the cattle destroyed. Losses to businesses affected received little to no such compensation. A report into the 2001 outbreak would go on to repeat many of the failures identified by the 1968 report into the previous outbreak. A key failure had in both instances been the delay to respond to the impending epidemic. At the start of the crisis, an animal could only be culled following a positive test for FMD, which delayed matters and risked further spreading of the disease. For those vets, slaughtermen and staff working to control the disease, the toll was great. Many worked 12-hour days, 7 days a week, and suffered greatly in terms of stress and burnout. Out of all of the failures, the role of those slaughtering the animals was the only process held to have been effective, noted for its smoothness and humanity. But there was a massive problem with disposal, with tens of thousands of animal carcasses left to rot in the fields as the scale of the slaughter exceeded capacity. In some instances, the leakage of buried infected animal tissues and blood threatened the groundwater, and thus a risk of further spread. Delays in bringing the armed forces to assist with the matter only contributed to the poor response. Blair's government failed in a number of ways, but succeeded in complying with the demands of the National Farmers Union. The union was opposed to vaccinating their herds, fearing the economic impact in respect to exporting vaccinated livestock. It was feared that Britain would lose its disease-free status, and its access to export markets worth £570 million a year. 
The estimated cost of the vaccination programme for all of Britain's farms would have been around 200 million, with the possibility of regaining disease-free status a year later. As seen in the example of Holland, vaccination could have played an important role in containing the disease. The MAFF was reorganised and renamed to the Department of Environmental Food and Rural Affairs. Tony Blair succeeded in the general election which was held in June, whilst the disease still ravaged the countryside. One-eighth of the British livestock were culled, whilst official figures sought to downplay the crisis. The foot and mouth disease of 2001 shows the consequences of failing to learn from a previous crisis and the horrific dangers of infectious disease.